what we were working with, what we were doing last time was we were computing the work, the work that gravity contributes to an object's change or a system's change in kinetic energy. So we found that uh, for gravity, the work contribution from, say, one position A to another position B, I should put total, I should put gravity, was equal to minus mv delta y, where delta y is the change in height. Uh, this delta y is yb minus ya. So one thing that I'd like to tell you about, and I, I left you on a cliffhanger last weekend, or last week, was that the, the point that, that I'd like to point out is that the work done by gravity doesn't actually care about the path that you take to get from point A to point B. The example that I gave involved a loopy loop, right? Um, but it didn't matter that it took a loopy loop. It, all that mattered was its initial height, ya, and its final height, yb. So um, in this case, gravity, only there's about and this is by the way this is true for all gravitational or for all work calculated sorry that is true for all work done by gravity only cares about the initial and final positions you could generalize the thing that the uh, calculation that we did last week and you'll see that regardless of the path that it takes, it always just cares about the initial and final position. And so this property that work only cares about, the work done by gravity only cares about the initial and final positions, it's not something that's true for every force. Um, in, in fact, most forces it doesn't hold for. However, there is a type of force for which this property that the and that the work done by a force only cares about the initial and final positions. Forces that have that property have a name. In fact, forces with this property, i.e., work only depends only depends on the initial and final position. we're talking about here. Forces that have that property are called conservative forces. Underline there. So gravity would be our first example of a conservative force. So there's a weird consequence of this property of, of a force being a conservative force. That is, if an object takes a path object takes a path through space, and we're just saying like the object just moves to one place and then moves to another place and so on and so forth. An object takes a path that starts where it ends, or rather that ends where it starts. If the audio is bad, I can call in. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me call in really quick. Um, Sorry, I don't like that it's that it does this, but uh, scroll down. Uh, one, two, one, two, six, three, six, six, seven, nine, nine. Is it is it that it's quiet? Let me All right, all right. Can you hear me now? Testing, testing, testing. testing. All right, all right. Um, um, I'm going to put myself on speaker. Speaker. So that, so that, why can I hear myself? This is weird. This is weird. Um, um, oh, oh. There we go. 
better. Uh, can you, is it all right now? Okay, let, let's proceed. Right, so if an object takes a path that it ends or that ends where it starts, then regardless of the path taken, a conservative force does no work. So let's think about that for a moment. So if we look at the example of gravity, come on, scroll for me, William. If we look at the example of gravity, if an object starts and ends at the same place, then the vertical position y will be the same. And so the work done by gravity would be zero. But we can see it even more explicitly just by any time, that, or, or we can see it more explicitly just by noting that if it's conservative, that means it depends only on the final and initial conditions. So it's the delta of something. It might not be the delta of y, it might be the delta of x or the delta of x squared or whatever. Um, yes, yes it is. Um, or, or whatever, but the point is it's the delta of some position of some position dependent function. And so if you're starting and ending at the same position, then that delta is zero because whatever you're taking the delta of is the same initially and finally. So we can put this mathematically in the following sense. We have that the work done, scroll please. Uh, that the work done by a conservative force from a position A to a position A is equal to an integral. This is just the definition of work, f dot dl. But we're going to amend this integral. So it looks a little bit different. We're going to put a little decoration there. And we say that this is equal to zero. And that's for the reason that I just described. If a conservative force starts and ends at the same place, A and A, then we say that it's or then it doesn't do work. Now, what this symbol represents is it means that the that the integral is over a closed path, or rather a long. So what that means is that the path loops up to it, to itself. So it starts at one place, goes along, and does whatever, but it closes back up. So any closed path, any time you integrate a conservative force along a closed path, you get zero. That's just the consequence of the fact that it started and ended in the same place. So we can show this explicitly just for gravity. Let's do an explicit example of gravity doing this. So let's say that we have a ball thrown upwards and then it's caught at the same height. So, so you have, a, where's my, okay, well, I don't have my ball with me, but you have a ball, you throw it upwards and then you catch it back at the same height. The question is, is how much work does gravity do? Now, we already know the answer. It started and ended at the same place. So the work that gravity does should be zero, but let's show that mathematically. So the work done by gravity, say from the hand to the hand, can be broken up into two segments. The work done by gravity from the hand up into the air, and then the work done by gravity from, the, from up in the air back down to the hand. So this can be written as a sum. Notice that you can always break up an integral into its constituent, par constituent parts. So this can be written as the work done by gravity from the hand to the air, and this is to its maximum height in the air, say, plus the work done by gravity from its maximum height in the air to the hand. So now we can just compute. So the work done by gravity, say from the height of the hand to the height of the maximum to the maximum height in the air, gravity points downwards with, and the force can be written as minus mg in the j hat direction, um, j assuming to be us. And then the path is just straight up, dy j hat. And then the same integral for the, uh, or the similar integral, for the path going from the air to the hand would look like this. We have an integral from the height of the air to an integral from the height of the hand. And then we have the same force minus mgj and the same path length. Now, we have to be careful here. Um, there is a subtlety to what's going on here. I'm choosing to parameterize the, uh, the integral pointing upwards, and then we're integrating the bounds going downwards. We could have parameterized the path going downwards and then we would have just had um, a path length that is positive at the top or, or that is zero at the top and then goes and then increases as we go down. It's a choice, but I could have done I could have gone either way. And I can be more explicit about that at the end of a uh, lecture if you, if you guys want. 
And so we can evaluate. Oh, scroll face. This is minus mg. We can pull out the mg, and then we can just integrate dy. That is integrating dy from the height of the ant to the height of the air. We'll call that delta y. And then we integrate, again, we have minus mg. But now, <clears throat> now the, uh, the order, the bounds of the integral are flipped. So we have y, or, so we have a large number, y air, that is subtracted from a small number, y hand. So this would give us a minus delta y. And so we can find that this indeed just does give you zero. Um, and again, I can spend more time on this later if you want to, if, if you guys want to stick around and watch, but it, it is, it, this is correct and it does take a little bit of justification. Um, but that's the basic gist of it. We can just check explicitly that the work done uh, around a closed path, in this case, goes up and then back down, is zero, the work done by gravity. Now, there are other elastic forces, sorry, other conservative forces, and another one that we're going to see a lot is the elastic force. So let's talk about why the elastic force is conservative. So just as a quick aside, remember Hooke's law. So Hooke's law was a statement about the force due to the, or about the elastic force, really. And it was a statement that the elastic force was equal to negative k, which is the spring constant, times delta x vector, where delta x vector is the vector that points from the equilibrium to the, or to the place where the object currently is. So it, it's a displacement vector from the equilibrium position. So let's compute the work done by a spring on a block as the spring is compressed. Work done by a spring on a block. Let's compute this just to check what it would give us. So the picture is maybe we have initially, we have our spring attached to a wall. We have our uh, equilibrium position. So the spring is a little bit compressed right now. And then I should put this down a little bit lower. Wall doesn't need to be that tall. This is our current position at XA. That's the initial current position. It's, it starts out a little bit compressed and we're gonna compress it more. So then after, after the compression is done, our configuration might be something like this. Boxes here. Our position now is at XB, right? So it's, it, we, we've compressed it just a little bit. And the way we did that was by pushing on it. But, but it doesn't really matter where that external force comes from. We're just going to try to compute the work done by the spring. So the work done by the spring can be, can be computed by using the path integral, or the line integral, rather. From A to B, it would be an integral from A to B of the force from the spring on the block dot dl. Now dl, the object is moving to the right, so dl can just be viewed as dx i hat. The force on the block from the spring should just be, well, if the position is xa, then at delta x on the left would just be xa minus zero, and delta, delta x on the right would just be xb minus zero. So put another way, the delta x in this coordinate system is just the variable x, just the coordinate, it's just the coordinate position x where x equals zero at the equilibrium position. So that becomes, uh, from Hooke's law, that becomes minus k x i hat. The dl, the path, it goes to the right. So the path is dx i hat. And so now we can do some simplification. This becomes an integral of minus k integral from x a to xb, really, um, the i hat dotted into itself is one, and we're left with just x dx. So we can do this integral now. This is just an integral from xa to xb of some polynomial, right? So what we end up with is we end up with minus one half k xb squared uh, minus one half k xa squared. Or put another way, why is it minus x? Because that's what Hooke's law is. Hooke's law it's to imply that the force is to the right if delta x is to the left. 
That is, put another way, this is minus one half K delta of X squared, which is to say that <clears throat> you take the distance from equilibrium at e either before or after, you square it, and then you take the difference. So you do XB squared minus XA squared. That is the, uh, is the term that you take the delta of, and then you multiply by, my, by minus one half K. Now here, Delta x squared is positive, and so our end result here is negative, right? You have a positive delta x squared multiplied by a negative, uh, a negative one half k, so you get a negative number, and that kind of makes sense. If the if the spring was initially moving to the right at some speed, the spring is going to slow it down, right? Because it's compressing more and more and more. So the work that it does, the work that the spring does, is negative because it is reducing the kinetic energy of the kinetic energy of the block. The block was moving faster, and then it's moving slower. So if the kinetic energy goes, or if the velocity goes, sorry, the speed goes down, then the kinetic energy goes down, which would be explained by negative by a negative value of work from the work energy theorem. So just looking at this again, the result that we get isn't identical to the result that we get for gravity. In gravity, it was just. Um, mg8 or mg delta y here we see that uh or sorry minus mg delta y right here we see that we have minus one half k delta x squared so it's a different variable it's a delta x squared rather than a delta y but the point is is they both only depend on the initial and final positions in this case it's the initial and final position squared but it still depends only on the initial and final position um and so you can, so it's relatively easy to see that if we started and ended at the same place, well, if we started at say XA and ended at XA, then XA squared minus XA squared is zero. So it satisfies this round trip phenomenon, right? Where if you start and end at the same place, then the work done is zero. Um, now it's not true that all forces are conservative. Let me give you an example of a non-conservative force. So this would be kinetic friction is not conservative. So let's see why that is. So let's assume that we have a block. Uh, let's assume that we have a block slide back, back and forth on a rough surface. So Remember, we're just computing the work done by the by the singular force of kinet kinetic friction, not uh, not like all of the other external forces that could be applied. Yeah, Walter Loon's excellent, by the way. So the picture is is you have an object that starts at A, and then it slides to the right to B. And then it slides back to A on a rough surface, right? So if it were conservative, then the work done by the kinetic friction force would be zero. Let's call this direction the plus X direction, just that way then we can do our integrals properly. So when moving right, we know that the kinetic friction force will have to be to the left because the kinetic friction force opposes relative motion. So we have that the kinetic friction force is equal to minus mu sub k n i hat because it has magnitude mu sub k n and it points to the left. And when moving left, the kinetic friction force will point to the right. F sub k is mu sub k n i hat. Okay, so far so good. So then we can compute the work starting from a going to b and then coming back to a. The total work done by the kinetic friction force would be the work done from A to B plus the work done from B to A. Uh, I should write it in the notation that I've already used. A to B plus the work done from B to A. Okay, so now we can just compute. We know what the force is, we know what the path is. So let's compute. So we have an integral from XA to XB of minus mu sub k n, so we're doing from A to B, this is when it's moving left, i hat, dotted into dx i hat, plus an integral from xb to xa, mu sub k n, i hat, dotted into dx i hat. The same thing, by the way, the reason why we have a positive 
um, a positive or a, a path that's pointing to the right here is again, it's the same as we had for the ball. It's because we're going, we're integrating backwards. So having a positive or having a, 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 right, a, a right pointing path is fine so long as you're integrating backwards. Alternatively, you could be integrating forward, say from uh, zero to delta x, and then you would need to have a negative uh, path. Either way is fine, it's just a matter of parameterization. And so we find after doing this integral, we find that we get minus mu sub k n delta x, where delta x is this, this distance here. It's a positive value, plus minus mu sub k n delta x. And importantly, this is minus two mu sub k n delta x, which is not zero. And in particular, it's negative. So just, just as we mentioned with the spring, the kinetic friction force slows down the object. And that's because it's doing negative work. Negative work means the kinetic energy decreases, the kinetic energy decreases, and so does the speed. And it's not zero because delta x isn't zero, n isn't zero, and these of k are all not zero. So there we go. That's evidence, that's proof that kinetic friction is not conservative. You can come up with a path. Um, so I can explain that more in more detail. The idea basically is that when you integrate a, let, let's say that you're integrating a function, say from xa to xb, right? If you integrate dx, that means that you're moving to the right a little bit at a time, and you're adding up as you go. But another way to view this is if you integrated backwards, if you wanted to integrate backwards like we want to, you could integrate backwards and then just add up all of these, how do I want to phrase this? Doing, doing an integral backwards like this with a path pointing to the left, that means that you're going from, say, parameterizing this as, say, x, or as, uh, let me call this, s equals zero, you would integrate from s equals zero to x, s equals delta x. But alternatively, you could just integrate from x equals xb, and then integrate to the right. But when you have, an, but when you have the top and the bottom of the bounds of the integral, are in the uh, when the when you integrate to the right with a with a a bottom bound or a a bottom terminal terminal higher than the top terminal that actually means you're integrating last. It's just a calculus thing. It's 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 just this whole business that uh, f of x dx is equal to negative b a f of x dx. This is all I'm saying. That, 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 that's, that's all this is about. You just don't want to double count your direction. We can talk more talk about it in more detail later, though. Um, but that's that's all this is about. Basically, if I had stuck a negative sign here and used this ordering, then I would be double counting the direction, and we don't want to do that. Okay. Um, so so this is just an example, and that's because so here the path mattered. The distance that the object traveled to, before it went back home mattered. If it had gone even further, this delta x would be different. So the larger the, or the longer the path in this case, the, the greater the change or the, the, the greater the work done. So in this case, the kinetic frictional force, the amount of work kinetic frictional, the amount of work that the kinetic frictional force does depends on the path that the object follows, unlike conservative forces. I don't know why I'm having a hard time talking today. Anyway. So those are just a few examples. Um, as we see more, we will see that some are conservative and some are non-conservative. Um, but we can move on now. We can talk about another notion, which is the notion of power. So <clears throat> forces, as we know, change the total energy of a system. And the, the way that they do that is a force acts on a, acts on a system or acts on an object. And that object's speed will either increase, decrease, or stay the same. If it increases or decreases, then the kinetic energy of the system changes, right? Kinetic energy being related to the speed. So power measures how fast that energy transfer occurs. How fast a force transfers energy via work. So we say how fast. That matters, right? Because you could, for example, um, let's say you're in a car, right? You slam your foot down on the pedal, your speed is going to go from zero to not zero quickly. But the amount of work done doesn't care about how quickly you accelerated. The, the amount of work only depends on what your final speed was and what your initial speed was. 
so but but the amount of work so the amount of work would be the same as if you just very slowly accelerated, right? Because your final initial speed would be the same. The amount of work done, if you slowly accelerate as opposed to very quickly accelerate, is the same. But the rate at which that work changed the, uh, like the, the time rate of change at which the work changed the kinetic energy of the car, that is different in the two cases. And so power encapsulates that notion. So formally, We write that the power P is the time rate of change, time derivative of work. And so we can figure out what the units of power are. The units would be the units of, of work, which is joules divided by the units of time, which is seconds. And this gets another special name. It gets the name of the watt, W-A-T-T, -T, abbreviated as a capital W, which is confusing because W also stands for work. But, you know, and I think James Watt lived in like the 1800s, like most of these guys did. So just like work, we can isolate the power delivered by single forces, right? We can, in a car, for example, there's going to be frictional forces, but there's also going to be forces coming from the internal combustion engine and so on. So we could compute, for example, just the power delivered by the internal combustion engine, just by figuring out the rate of, or the, uh, the time derivative of the work contributed by that particular source. So for example, uh, Actually, is there, yeah, so, 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 yeah, actually, I'll, I'll just leave it there. So just like how you can compute the work done by individual forces, you can also com compute the power output by individual forces. So even though, for example, if you're on cruise control in a car, your speed isn't changing, so the work done is zero, and so the power is zero, it's still, it's still the case that your car is outputting power because there's opposing forces that are using up power, frictional forces and so on. So there's a shortcut for computing power that I wanna go over just so you guys can see it. Scroll please. It's like I have to ask it nicely. So, So the shortcut uses the formula above. So we have that P is dW dt, but dW dt can be written. Well, we know that a small amount of work done, remember that work is an integral of F dot dL. And so dW should just be equal to F dot dL, not an integral, right? Because what you do when you wanna find the total work done is you integrate those small amounts of work done. So dW is F dot dL, divided by dt. Now, this is bad mathematics, but it works, so bear with me. Um, and so we can, uh, the f is not infinitesimal, so we can just pull it out. So this is f dot dl dt. Now, remember that dl represented the small path that the object, or the, the, the small change in position that the object takes. And so dl dt would be the velocity that the object has at a particular time. So that is to say the power is just the force dotted into the velocity vector. Now, this is, so, so to summarize or to write it out and put a box around it, this is just a true relationship relating power and uh, force and velocity. Now, just so you know, when you're computing this, these have to be evaluated at the same time. The speed might be changing or the velocity might be changing, the force might be changing. So if you wanna compute the power at a particular instant in time, the power output, then you'd have to know the force at that particular instant in time and you would have to know the velocity at that particular instant in time. Or if you say you want, you know the power and you know the velocity, then you would need, then you could find the force and so on. So this is a useful, use, useful relationship because often, why, why, because this is bad mathematics. Really, if you actually go back and look up our derivation of work, we actually already had a relationship that looked like uh, uh, it was something like uh, DDT. We had DDT of one half mv squared was equal to f dot v. We already had this. And then we kind of, um, we wrote v as dl dt. And then we multiplied both sides by dt and then integrated. So, but we already had this. And this is the rate of change at which that, this is the rate of change of the energy. This is uh, dw dt from the work energy theorem. So, so you actually don't need to work backwards. You can just go back and look at what we did to derive the work energy theorem. Uh, so, so you have to integrate with respect to 
Like you can, you can always integrate both sides. You could integrate power over time and that would give total power, but then you'd have to integrate S, integrating S dot V DT is not necessarily easy, right? You have to know how S dot V changes with time. Um, okay, so that's enough about power. There's a few examples that I linked to in the lecture notes, but power is a relatively straightforward concept. It's just the rate at which energy is delivered by some force. So let's move and talk about a very broad topic. Let's talk about the energy conservation model. It's not super broad, but it's super important anyway. Energy conservation model. So remember when we first started talking about, or actually it was in the first lecture, we talked about this notion of models. So this is, so the models that we've already, that we've talked about going forward, or the models that we've already talked about are models like the model, Newton's model of force, right? This notion of force is a, it's a brain model. Like it's not a thing that necessarily exists. It's just a model that we use to conceptualize and make predictions about the world. Now we're gonna talk about another model which links up to this model of force. And that's how you know when you have good models, by the way, when they start linking together in various ways, that's when you know that your model might really have teeth, might actually make good predictions. But before we can talk about energy conservation, we need to talk about this notion of a system. So, uh, well, okay, before we talk about systems, we even have one other thing to talk about. So for now, we're basically done with computing work done by, the ind by an individual force. Rarely, I mean, this will be asked of you, maybe on an exam or on a homework or whatever, but rarely will you actually be asked to figure out some path integral or some line integral. Often, there'll be easier ways to handle it. So before we, should, before we move on though, I do need to clarify one thing. So we know that for every force, there's an equal and opposite force acting on a different object, right? That's Newton's third law. So the question is, is when you're computing the work done by a force, how do you know which force in the third law pair you use, to you use when computing work? Now that might seem trivial to some of you, but to some of you it might not be. So the, the answer is, and, and I know I'm just talking about this, but it's just important to get it out of, out of the way. The answer is that you use the force on the object. So when you're plugging in S net, into your work energy or into your line integral, the F that you plug in is the work or is the force on the object, not the force from the object. And the DL, the path that that object takes is the displacement of that same object that has force applied to it. Now, even though the, even though uh, <clears throat> force has a third law pair, there is no, there is no third law for work. This is an important point. So just because one object does some amount of work on a different object does not mean that the second object does the same amount of work in the opposite direction on the first object. <coughs> Sorry. Um, if you guys are, if you guys want to look into something interesting, Look up, um, what's it called? Oh, there's a name for it. Uh, the photic sneeze reflex. It's interesting. Um, it's a genetic anomaly that about a third of the population has, basically, and it's why I looked up and looked around. Basically, it's people with this genetic mutation. Um, sneeze more often when they look at bright things. So if you feel like a sneeze is coming, then you can look around, find something bright to look at, and it'll force the sneeze out. Very interesting. And whenever I walk out of a dark movie theater, I sneeze. So the more you know. Anyway, um, like I said, something like a third of the population has it. Funny story. Um, right, so there's no third law for work. And a way to see this, a relatively easy way to see this, is that a, uh, the Earth does gravitational work on an apple when the apple's falling, right? So yes, it's, uh, no, it's not because work is a scalar, although kind of. So, so, when, so when the apple falls, it has some force on it, mg, and it falls some distance. Now, that same force from Newton's third law is also acting on the earth in the opposite direction. So the, as the apple's falling down, the earth, or the apple's pulling the earth up a little bit. So while the forces are the same, the distance traveled are, is not. So the apple falls you know, really far. Whereas the Earth barely moves at all because the Earth has huge mass. So the work done 
by the apple on the earth is much, much, much smaller than the work done or on the apple by the earth. So, so, so there just is no third law pair for, for work. It's just not a thing. So to keep this notion of which objects have which forces and how you compute the work done on different objects that are clumped together, we're going to introduce this notion of the system. I might say it again soon. Keep everything straight. So a system is a group or collection of at least one object at least one object that we have arbitrarily lumped together. So a system is an arbitrary choice. What if we drop like 10 million apples at once? Well, in fact, there's no, the earth is really, really big, like so mind-bogglingly big, like it, it, it wouldn't happen. Like, 10 million apples is, is peanuts to the earth, right? Um, right, so, so a system is just, it's just an arbitrary invisible box that we've drawn around a collection of things, that's all. There is no answer for what the system is defined to be because it's however you choose, to be, choose it to be. It's just a mental tool that helps us keep things straight. So the, it's, an important point is that the grouping that we make should be isolated from other things. For example, um, didn't XKCD answer that question? Anyway, um, for example, me as a collection of organs and, you know, I have skin and I have stuff inside my skin and meat inside my skin sack and bones that are armor made of, anyway, humans are weird. Humans are a, uh, a meat driving a bone or a, a sack of meat driving a bone mech very strange if you think about it too hard. Anyway, but me, I'm a collection of objects, right? I'm a collection of a brain and a skull and skin and a stomach and intestines and kidneys and so on. Um, but that is a collection of organs that we call the system that is Sam. And I'm isolated from the earth. Like I'm, I'm on the earth and I am, but I, I can be isolated from the earth. Um, so we can just call me a system and that system would be separate from the earth. And so the earth could act as an external Force and apply it to me. But importantly, two things in the same system, or a, a system cannot apply a force to itself. A system can apply forces to other parts of the system, but the net force on the system won't, or uh, would, be, would still be zero. This is why if you're floating around in space, you can't just like push yourself because you are a system and you can't apply a net force to yourself. So, the, but an important point is that forces, external forces, external forces can act on the grouping as a whole. So the gravitational force on me is really a force on a whole system, right? It's the gravitational force on my liver, plus the gravitational force on my skull, and so on. But we can combine those to be the gravitational force on the whole system and just call it the gravitational force of the, or on the system. So, but what we can do is we can actually distinguish from a sensible perspective, like we can, we can draw a dividing line between works that are done that are, or works done by forces internal to the system. So for example, God, my nose is so itchy. I'm going to sneeze. Um, so, for example, if I'm pushing back and forth, this is a work. I'm, I'm applying a work to my hand, right? Like this hand is applying a work to this hand. But that's a work internal to the system. And then we can also think about works external to the system. So if I drop this pen on my hand, the pen, when it hits my hand, does work on me, even though it's not part of the system. So we can group these works as external, external works and internal works. Mm. 
So the way that we might do that is we would write that the total work done on the system, we would write it as, you know, W1 plus W2 plus dot, 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 where these are internal works. So this square root, oh, okay, plus the work done by internal forces. And we know that the total work is equal to the change in kinetic energy from the work energy theorem. So for reasons that we're going to discuss later, we can actually, re we actually might want to rearrange this equation into the following. We have that the sum of the external works is equal to the change in the kinetic energy minus the sum of the internal works. No, so W, so, so these subscripts apply to each of these. Oh, sorry. Yeah, external, there we go. Right, so we can just rearrange this. So we're left with a simpler or not a simpler, a different way of describing, a different way of describing this, of the work energy theorem. And so like a good example would just be a block pushed, across, pushed along a rough surface. If the block and the surface, like let's say it's a block and then a piece of sandpaper. If we treat the sandpaper and the block as a single system, which we could, then there's then the external forces on the system would be say the gravitational force and maybe the force that's pushing it along. That would be a, a, an external force. And then the internal forces would be the normal force because that's between the sandpaper and the block. So it's between two things inside the system. And it would be friction. Friction is between the sandpaper and the block. And if those are both the system, or if those are both in the system, then that is an internal force and hence produces an internal work. So just as a quick note, in the future, we're almost always going to make sure or to, to make the earth or treat the earth as internal to whatever system we're talking about. And the reason we do that is we could treat it as external, but we really want it to be on the right-hand side of this equation. So we're going to assume that like, if I'm talking about me, the system of me, really it's the system, system of me and the earth. The system of this pen and the earth. The system of this boat and the earth. That's, that's uh, because we want to treat gravity as an internal force because it makes it easier to handle. So just keep that in mind. That's what we're going to do going forward. Right. So this is fine. This like We can just do this rearrangement, but it doesn't actually teach us anything until we start talking about what these internal and external forces are. So let's talk about energy first. Let's, let's take a quick detour and talk about different types of energy. So as you guys may have already guessed, we have kinetic energy. Yeah. If we had treated the, the block and the sandpaper and the earth as all part of the system, then yeah, gravity would be would be an internal force. Right, so we've already established that kinetic energy is a thing called energy. It's a type of thing called energy. And so you might say, are there other types of energy? And that's a good question to ask. We wouldn't have given it a special name or a descriptor of some other thing, energy. Um, we wouldn't have called it kinetic energy, we would have just called it something, something else separate, if there wasn't a, other types of energy, right? And so in fact, um, the other types of energies can be defined by work done by internal forces. So the reason why we separate this, by the way, is because kinetic energy is a thing that a system has. So if there's work done by an internal force, then that's a property about the system. It's not something that the system does to other things, it's a property about the system. So we could treat those works, even though they come from separate parts of the system interacting, we can treat those works as if they are properties of the system, just like how kinetic energy is a property of the system. This is, this is contrasted with force never being a property of the system. Force is a property of or it is force is a an interaction between two separate systems. 
So let me just summarize this idea really quick. So work done on a system by external forces changes the energy contained in the system. Work done by energy, uh, sorry, work done by external forces on a system change the energy of that system. And the reason we're get, we're, the reason we can say that is because we're saying is that all of the internal works, those are actually not, we're not going to treat those as work. We're going to treat those as energies of the, of the system. So if you have an external work that's not zero, then it'll change the energies of the system. So there are three types of energy changes that can occur. Let me outline those really quick. So there's kinetic energy, which you already know. So if you just push on an object, the speed can change, which is which changes the kinetic energy. This is from uh, from uh, from the motion of objects in the system. So like if the system is me and the earth, it's not me and the earth moving together, but just a part of the system, me, is moving. And so the kinetic energy of the system can increase or change. There's also could be changes. So these are the types of energy that can that can be changed because there is an external work applied. And so another example would be changes from work done within the system by conservative forces. So the example here would be you have the system of me plus the earth, right? So let's say that, uh, or no, let, let's let's say it's let's say it's uh, the phone plus the earth, right? So I'm not part of the system. It's just the phone and the earth is the system. So if I apply an external work or an external force here to lift it up, the, that, that, that extra energy that I'm adding to the system by doing work on the system, that's coming because there is a conservative work inside the system that's doing that work. In this case, it's the gravitational force. So the gravitational work is increasing, or rather, technically, it's decreasing, but, but that's a negative sign that, we'll, that we won't worry about yet. Um, and then the third type is changes from work done by non-conservative work. So again, if I'm pushing this along my hand, the phone being the system, then there's a non-conservative force acting on it in this direction of friction, right? Or, and so I'm applying, I'm applying an external work actually consider my hand and my this, this hand and my phone to be the system, then applying an external work should increase the kinetic energy, except it can't because there's an internal non-conservative force, which is instead taking up that energy or non-conservative work that's taking up that energy. In this case, that would be energy associated with non-conservative friction. And so what we can do is we can take these two things and we can say that that we have work one plus work two, these are all external. This is equal to a change in kinetic energy minus work one plus work two of conservative forces. These are internal to the system. I'm going to run out of space. Move this over as hard as I can. Plus work. That should be minus again. Minus work one plus work two plus all the dot. These are non-conservative. So these are internal work. These are external work. So we can split the internal work even further into ex internal work done by conservative forces and internal work done by non-conservative forces. So it's two o'clock, so we'll end it there. Uh, we do have a oh. God, I always feel like I don't get very far because I don't get very far. Um, so I'll spend some more time on this uh, next time. And uh, I guess we'll just continue.
So uh, I'm going to end lecture here, and I will ask if you guys have any questions. No, not not end lecture, end recording.